Hello, everyone, and welcome to this uh, uh, ISR <laughs> webinar on the economics of biodiversity, the Dasgupta Review. Um, I am here with uh, um, um, uh, Mr. Thomas Vigas from uh, the Bank of England, and uh, which is a co-author of uh, the Dasgupta Review, and uh, with uh, Professor Polikins from uh, our ISR Institute. So first of all, uh, uh, welcome Thomas and welcome Paul. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. <clears throat> And my name is Lorenzo Lotti, and I'm an associate professor at, uh, uh, in teaching at, um, in, at, uh, at um, uh, UCL ISR. Uh, so just before starting, a few, a few comments on, uh, on the rules of, uh, of this webinar. You have a Q&A uh, button on the bottom of the screen. So uh, whenever you uh, have a question, just write it there, and then we will uh, coordinate uh, uh, among us to um, like share them with the, our uh, uh, panelists um, after the presentation, um, and yeah, uh, for for the rest we will uh, um, start, uh, um, of course, with uh, a brief uh, introduction, and then uh, um, Thomas uh, will uh, uh, share his presentation with uh, with us with uh, uh, further comments from uh, uh, Professor Ikins. And uh, we aim to uh, leave around uh, 20 minutes uh, for uh, a Q&A uh, activity at the end of the, of the, of the webinar. Um, so uh, let's, let's start then, I would say. So as you know, this webinar is about uh, the Dasgupta Review, uh, which is this uh, like uh, independent uh, global review, which has been uh, sponsored by the UK uh, Treasury. And uh, um, we, the final review is, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Thomas will be <laughs> for uh, the autumn, but we already have uh, initial, an initial report, which was just been out for some months now. Um, uh, Thomas uh, uh, is, uh, is um, uh, a Bank of England uh, uh, economist that is now working for uh, the Climate uh, Lab. <coughs> this is uh, a co-author of uh, the economics of Biodiversity, so the Dasgupta Review. Um, is also a member of uh, uh, the Climate Disclosure Standard Board. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, you, you have been uh, some time working for the HM uh, Treasury on, on the Dasgupta Review, and then now you are back for, uh, uh, in, in the, within the Bank of England, right? Yeah, that's correct. One of the plus sides of, um, I guess, the, the coronavirus is I can move jobs, but stay very still in my own house. <laughs> and that is uh, also very good and positive for the environment. Uh, <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much. And, uh, so thank you for being here and uh, with us. And uh, I will uh, uh, leave you now um, and I will put myself on mute uh, so you can uh, uh, start the presentation. Uh, whatever like happens, I'm happy to jump in and uh, uh, help out intervene. Sure. Well, thank you again, Lorenzo. Um, thank you, um, Harry, also for, for helping organise. And thank you more broadly to US, uh, UCL for inviting me back, um, albeit virtually, sadly not in person. It's a pleasure always to come back um, to UCL, um, where actually I, was, I did my master's degree in economics with Lorenzo. Um, so we go back some time. Um, but yeah, so it's great to be great to be here and to talk about the Descriptor Review on the Economics of Biodiversity. Oh, I'm just about to share my slides, but just before I start, as Lorenzo says, um, uh, this presentation is um, everything that I show today will be my personal views and not the views of um, the UK government, the UK Treasury, the Bank of England. They're strictly personal views, so any responses I'll give to questions are purely my own. Um, so if I just start, try to share my screen. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see this, um, but uh, Lorenzo or Harry, let yes. me know if not. Uh, we, yeah. we, we, can, we can see that, thanks. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, so great. So as I'm sure some of you or many of you may be aware um, from the brilliant programmes by Sir David Attenborough or being highlighted by Greta Thunberg and others, um, for the first time in 65 million years, um, the number of species worldwide is in mass 
decline. Um, according to some scientists, we're entering the sixth mass extinction of our planet. And indeed, study after study have highlighted the extent to which biodiversity across the world has been depleting and depleting for some time. But often the economic consequences of this decline are either overlooked or misunderstood. And indeed, that was the genesis for why back in 2019, um, the UK's government, or particularly the UK uh, Treasury, commissioned Sir Partha Desgupta, a professor at Cambridge, to lead a global independent review on the economics of biodiversity. And the review, which the final report was published in February, with an interim report had followed um, last autumn, uh, around autumn time, um, presents the first of its kind in a complete um, comprehensive economic framework that calls for urgent and transformative change. And the review is grounded in a deep understanding of ecosystem processes and earth, science, earth sciences and how the natural world and, uh, and economic activities interact and their relationship. And so this new framework by the review sets out a way in which we should account for nature in economics and decision making, and ultimately by doing so, sustainably engaging with nature and thereby being able to protect and enhance our collective prosperity. So I kind of want to start just by highlighting what, when we're talking about nature, biodiversity and the economy, what do we mean? And th this slide highlights a, a figure of the economy that I just want to touch on to start with. So the economy for, for many decades and generations, we know have been made up of two predominantly key forms of capital. And by capital here, I'm referring to a capital asset that is um, an item or a durable object that produces a flow of goods and services over time. So very distinct to financial assets. We're talking about here the kind of fundamental assets that um, indeed um, the, uh, Jeremy Bentham, I know, is still sitting there in some form in UCL <laughs> would have been referring to, but really going back to this fundamental form of capital. And so the economy for, for a long time um, is kind of well understood, whether you're doing your solo growth models or other model economic growth development models are made up of produced and human capital and actually the productivity element and how, how we use them fundamentally underpins is what we know is the economy. So produce capital of machines, buildings, roads, you name it. Human capital is our health, our skills, um, our knowledge um, as, a, as humans. But underpinning produced and human capital is natural capital or nature. And indeed, what this figure shows is that ecosystems Ultimately, and by ecosystems, I'm referring to any combination of species, organisms, whether they're living or non-living, um, biotic or abiotic, abiotic, that they come together um, and really underpin what we have of produced capital, human capital, and thereby the economy. Um, to put it simply, um, we wouldn't be as healthy as we were without nature because nature provides us with fresh water, clean air, um, uh, I'll get onto this a bit later, but also um, our ability to source pharmaceuticals to produce capital. If you think about the building, if you think about the magnificent building on the UCL campus that couldn't have been built without natural materials um, from the natural world. And indeed, all of the materials that are kind of behind it, obviously, ultimately stem from nature. So really, when we're thinking about nature and the economy, nature underpins both produced capital and human capital alongside um, providing direct input to, to our economy, whether it be agriculture or even or, um, mining or other activities. And what we know is that ecosystems, as I've described, whether it be a rainforest, whether it be a lake, whether it be a peatland, um, all of those ecosystems are vastly diverse. So if you had a microscope and you looked at them, looked at any one of them in close enough depth, you would see a thousand, potentially millions of organisms. And that is biodiversity. Biodiversity is the diversity within um, an ecosystem, or I'm going to use the term natural asset. And really, it is, that, it is that diversity there that is what we mean by biodiversity. And so I just touch, I hear, I just want to just give a few clear examples of um, what nature provides in terms of goods and services, or otherwise termed as ecosystem services. 
And this slide just gives you the variety of them. Now, as you'll notice, um, some of them we can easily see. Um, anyone outside can see um, a forest, the timber, uh, timber that's available, or we can see fresh water um, quite clearly. But there's aspects of ecosystem services we can't really see. For example, we can't really see climate regulation in action. We can't see um, easily um, the, the soils, the, the diversity that they bring and, it, that, and, and the services they provide in deeper agriculture and other activities. We can't also see, um, unless it's an extreme, the quality of air um, that we're, we're breathing in. So there is a distinction here, and I'll get onto it later, about the, the ecosystem services are broad, far reaching, and definitely far ranging. And there's there's a, a number, there's a classification of ecosystem services, um, which are classified as provisioning services, so stuff we take, so whether it be food, water, something that we take from nature, the regulating and maintenance services, so as I kind of mentioned, the maintenance of our soils and our air and our climate, and also our more um, cultural services, that being for like our, our um, if you think about um, how we can just enjoy the natural world for our own well-being and satisfaction. And so there's kind of three main classifications and it's something I want to touch on later, but just to give you that picture to start with. And so at its core, the Descriptive Review really talks about nature in this term as an asset, that being a capital asset. And I've just described um, the services it provides in terms of ecosystem services. And biodiversity is the diversity within our natural assets. And so I kind of want to take this a bit more to the realms of finance and indeed kind of for anyone with um, financial savings or that manages a portfolio of financial assets, it's kind of very well understood that greater diversity within a portfolio of financial assets reduces the risk and uncertainty associated with those returns. So that's where you, you'll hear people hedging their bets. Um, you make sure you diversify your risk. And indeed, the same is true when we look at the natural world and natural assets, that greater biodiversity reduces the risk and uncertainty associated with nature's return. So the ability for us to receive those ecosystem services. And so put simply, greater biodiversity increases the productivity, the resilience and the adaptability of nature. And so when we think about nature as an asset and we think about biodiversity as diversity within those natural assets, what the review highlights is that we're all asset managers. And now some of you might automatically, when you hear the phrase asset manager, think of a financier, whether it be in Tokyo, London, New York, moving vast sums of money. But again, I kind of really want to take a step back and talk about asset management in its real kind of purest sense, that every consumption and investment decision we make, every time we decide, decide to buy something online, or every time we decide to invest our money somewhere, we're ultimately at the very end influencing or determining the mix of produced human and natural capital in the world, whether it be consciously or unconsciously. And this framing of asset management, which the review underscores, also from the data we know that at the global level, we have collectively failed to manage our global portfolio of assets. So the chart on this slide, um, from the early 1990s uses UN data on per capita um, uh, stocks for produce human and natural capital. And it shows that since the early 90s, uh, for every person, for the average person in the world, produced capital, the number of machines, buildings has almost doubled. Uh, human capital, so our health and skills, for the average per person has gone up by around 15%. But natural capital, whether it be forests, estuaries, mangroves, you name it, per person, that's declined by 40%, for zero. So you can see that we've had this significant divergence between investing and building produced in human capital and a depletion of natural capital. And indeed, any economic policy or decision maker knows that um, the productive capabilities of our economy fundamentally relies on our stock of produced in human capital. And indeed, many of the policies that we see introduced ultimately are aiming to boost uh, our productive capabilities. But we haven't seen natural capital like that. And so thereby, this depletion in natural capital has actually been reducing the productive capabilities of our economy. 
And it's the way in which humanity for several decades that has achieved the prosperity that we've seen kind of at a very high level that has come at the expense of, of nature. And I kind of now I want to just take you a bit down further back in time. Um, and for those of you that knows your, your Charles Dickens, you'll know that when he was scribbling away a, a tale of two cities, referring to a pit, referring to conditions on either side of the English Channel in 1860, 1860, uh, 1859 to be precise, he described conditions on either side in London and Paris as the best of times and the worst of times. But indeed, Dickens could have also been talking about the prosperity of humanity and the natural world since the 1950. 1950s to modern day. So you can see on the left-hand side chart that for humanity and for the for the global economy, um, that's increased since 1950. Since where since the time where scientists now have agreed that the world entered the Anthropocene, um, moving on from the Holocene, um, that uh, the global economy has increased almost 15-fold. Um, the likelihood of being at in absolute po poverty has never been lower. The life expectancies um, increased dramatically and mortality rates have, have fallen dramatically. So today's person has been um, rich, average person in the world has been richer, more likely to live longer, um, be less likely to be in poverty at any time in human history. But that, um, from what we've seen, that's come at the expense of the natural world through the way in which humanity has approached growth and development. So we also know, as I highlighted at the start, that we've seen species extinction rates accelerate and they're around 100 to, to up to 1,000 times higher um, than at any point um, before that we've seen. The availability of ecosystem services, as I highlighted earlier, those ecosystem services, they've been on significant decline um, and the Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity um, has highlighted only two years ago that 14 out of the 18 critical ecosystem services have been in significant decline um, in the past 50 years. We all know we all we all know about the rising global temperatures to around one to 1.2 degrees higher uh, degrees Celsius higher than the Industrial Revolution, and more broadly, more broadly than just climate, we have been breaching a number of planetary boundaries, whether that be um, nitrogen levels um, in the atmosphere as well, climate obviously. Uh, uh, an, an obvious one, but we have we have been breaching um, the planet planetary boundaries. And the right hand side chart um, shows data from the WWF's Living Planet Index, which can be taken as a proxy for the availability of species around the world. And again, from the 1970s, we've seen around a 70 percent, 70 percent decline um, in species population. So a dramatic um, decline, just only 50 years. And so the review. Takes, takes from what we've seen and looks at the part, looks at previous decades and highlights that really when we strip this back, we, we can understand this as a really simple Econ 101 demand and supply issue. And by that, I mean our demands as, a, as humanity on the planet has far exceeded its capacity to supply. Or in other words, um, humanity's demands or its ecological footprint has been greater than nature's supply or what the review also terms its biosphere regeneration. And indeed, this is shown on the right hand side chart um, of what the review calls this impact inequality, that is our humanity's demands overshooting its supply. And humanity's demands are made up of three fundamental factors, um, the human population, the activity per person, so our, our activities, whether that be consumption or investment activities, and the efficiency through which we use nature, we use the biosphere, I'm using the terms interchangeably here, um, we use its goods and services and crucially the ways in which we dispose of our waste. So how efficient are we at disposing the waste of the economic of, of our economic activities? On the supply side, this is made up of two factors, the stock of the biosphere or put simply the stock of natural assets that we have, going back to what I touched on earlier, and the rate at which nature regenerates itself. We know that nature for, for, for many of its um, uh, amazing wonders has this ability for quite a lot of ecosystems to, to be able to regenerate itself. If you think about a forest and other plants, um, that it has this ability as well. And so kind of put simply, we've been overshooting. We've had a demand overshoot at a global level. And to give you a rough estimate for the extent to which we have, 
Um, there's been work by the Global Footprint Network that estimates around the 1960s, so going back to when we started to enter the Anthropocene, the, this relationship between humanity's demands and nature supply was almost parity. We were, we were living off our means, as it were. But now, um, at their latest estimate for 2020, um, and this takes into account all the dramatic effects from, from COVID and, and the lockdowns associated with it across the world, um, this, this ratio is about 1.6. And so conceptually, this means that to sustainably have the global economy in 2020 forever, we would need 1.6 planets continuously. And so while we know that um, some very rich entrepreneurs uh, have ambitions to go to Mars and to, so, and to so that we can settle in other planets, um, for the foreseeable future, in any case, we only have one planet that is Earth. And so by any definition, that 1.6 forever is, is truly unsustainable. And it's this unsustainable engagement the review highlights that is endangering the prosperity of current and future generation. And it highlights that the ways it's really endangering this is two things that I'm going to talk on this slide. The first is the existence of ecosystem tipping points and regime shifts. So ecosystems can um, live or, or exist in um, stable, um, biodiversity rich productive states or really un, or really um, not biodiverse um, unproductive states. And the way in which it can switch from that rich and productive to poor and unproductive state is called um, a regime shift and the tipping point is the moment it, it falls. And so many of you or some of you might be familiar with the discussions going on um, about um, the Amazon rainforest and the extent to which through our through activities and land use change in the area, we're continuously increasing our de, um, deforestation there. And scientists estimate that we're very that we're close um, from a tipping over from a from a beautiful complex rainforest full of productive life to um, a vast um, savanna um, with with which which would be incredibly unproductive um, to the to the uh, ecosystem there. And now these tipping, tipping points of regime shifts, um, they're, they're non-linear, they're very hard to predict um, with any accuracy, but their effects, if they happen, could be far reaching. So going back to the Amazon example, so the best available science today tells us that if the Amazon tipped over, that that would affect not just the region's local climate, but it would affect um, the global climate, it would affect global water and wind cycles. And indeed, it would affect agricultural productivity as far away just through those wind and water cycles um, as southern USA. So it can be really have this what we would call global spillovers in terms of these ecosystem collapses. And we know that for many of these uh, regime shifts, there are simply points of no return. So if the Amazon switched, it's almost impossible to get it back to what it is now. So when it comes to nature, there are points of no return. The second point I want to highlight is the option value of nature. And so by this, I mean that um, nature has um, value in terms of we can use it today for stuff that are for economic activities. But we and I think as human history has shown that we constantly um, through new uh, discoveries, increase knowledge, realize over time that there's aspects um, of the natural world that can help us overcome challenges, both currently and potentially future challenges. And to give an example, around 70% of drugs to help um, alleviate the symptoms of cancer um, already today have been inspired um, by nature. And indeed, of the, of the amount of organisms um, that we actually know of, there's estimates that there's probably, we've only um, understood or observed 10% of the world's of organisms living in the world's ocean. So that's 90% undiscovered. That's 90% that could potentially hold solutions for challenges we face. Indeed, even if we look to the current um, vaccines for COVID-19, they've ultimately stemmed um, from being inspired from natural natural world and natural processes. And so when we start to, when we realize nature's option value, we also should realize that for every extinction, every species, that dies out, every, every species that by the nature of extinction will not return, that we lose the benefits it potentially holds for future challenges. So when it comes to nature, there is value in keeping our options open. Um, and we do that through, through reducing extinctions. 
And so combined, this risk and uncertainty through tipping points and option value kind of gives an undisputable um, um, message that we should act now rather than later to preserve the natural world. Conservation that is protecting what we have and sustaining it is more preferable than restoration because in some cases that's, that can't happen. And that because of this option value and because of the far reaching implications of tipping points and their macroeconomic implications, it's less costly to act now rather than later. And so, so combined, what we need to do is we need to protect and conserve our natural assets now to, to stem the endanger or to stem potential endangering of our prosperity for both our current and future generations. Now, many of you at this point is wondering, well, how, how did we get there? How for decades has humanity kind of got up to this point? And the review highlights that really at its core, this the problem lies, this problem of unsustainably engaging with the natural world lies in deep-rooted, widespread institutional failure, not just mere market failure. So institutions here abroad, um, they're the rules um, that govern our collective undertaking. They are, they are the um, rules and regulations that make up households, businesses, governments, um, multilateral fora. And really um, what they've done at their core is they've failed to account for, na for nature, for the natural world, um, and its economic benefits um, in a sustained manner. And there's three key pervasives of nature, which I touched on earlier. It's mobility, it's silence, and it's invisibility. So it's mobility, if you think about the, um, if you think about, um, the, the beauty of birds migrating across the world um, every, every year throughout the seasons. If you think about it, silence, um, a tree does a vast amount of, of um, amazing jobs <laughs> and we don't hear it and the invisibility so to go back to the soil example we we won't see the amazing benefits that the soils are doing currently but they're going on right underneath our feet um, and that these three three pervasive key features of nature have made it difficult for our institutions to comprehensively record or use impacts associated with nature and indeed um, what we've failed to do is to have effective institutions, that are institutions that account for nature, that have sustained strong regulations, that can have um, enforcement, that can penalise people, institutions, economic agents, that harm or deplete the natural world, and that incentivises economic actors to conserve and restore the natural world. And to give an example, the review highlights, um, we know for decades governments across the world have actually been subsidising activities that have incentivized greater depletion of natural resources um, than conserving or restoring them um, to the tune currently of around four to six trillion US dollars a year. And so really when we when we think about why why this has happened, it's a failure to account, it's a failure to have those effective institutions with those characteristics I mentioned earlier. And so when we're starting to think about how to sustainably engage with nature, this needs to be firmly um, in our minds. But a solution also starts in terms of sustainably engaging with the natural world with accepting um, what the review calls a simple truth, and that's that our economies are embedded within nature and not external to it. And so for those of you um, are familiar with economics and or mainstream economics, you'll, you'll know that standard models of economic development um, have tended to view humanity as external to nature. That is, and going back to the start of my presentation, they've included produced capital, human capital, but natural capital isn't in formally any of these models. And indeed, the relationship that these models of standard growth and development would characterize our relationship with nature is, is a bit, think about how we um, daily um, would interact with a lake, that we would take stuff from uh, the lake, we would take a fish, we would take stuff from the natural world, and when we're done with it, we would chuck it back in there as our waste, and that, that's our own inter our only interaction. Um, but that's not how um, ecology and earth scientists tell us our economic activities or our relationship with the natural world actually works in reality. All economic activities, to varying degrees, depend and impact on natural assets. So everything we do, as I highlighted at the start, depends on an ecosystem service to varying degrees. We all need air, water, materials, fuel, 
a, a, a good temperature, a stable climate to do to start to do any economic activity. And everything we do impacts on an ecosystem service. So this is just bro this is broader than just admitting carbon emissions. This is um, polluting water when we dispose of our waste. Anytime we chuck anything out for that as a consumer thing, we're, we're disposing of our waste. And where does that waste go? It ultimately has to go in some form back into the natural world. And by doing that, it will influence and disturb ecosystem processes. And to, to build on this, while some economic models have recognized that nature is finite, that we don't have an infinite resource base when it comes to nature, they have still assumed in some guise, most of them, that technological advances will allow us to break free from nature. That is, and it's something you quite regularly have heard in pockets of the climate debate at the moment, that if we increase carbon capture, if we increase carbon technologies, that ultimately we can fully do what we're doing, but control that. But, and I kind of want to take you back to the impact equation, um, that the efficiency with which we use nature really can be seen as a denominator in our global footprint. So we have our population, our economic activities and our efficiency. And so we can keep getting more efficient and reducing that footprint, but we're always going to be interacting with the natural world. So um, as many governments now have uh, pledged to reach net zero by 2050, even when, even when and hopefully we do reach net zero, we still, every activity, every consumption, every investment decision, we're always going to have to be interacting with the natural world. It was the case um, for our ancestors thousands of um, millions of years ago, and it's the case for us in the future too. And so while technology, technological advances can help us reduce our global um, ecological footprint, they can't be seen as a panacea to, to sustain the engagement with nature. And it's that accepting that our economy is embedded within nature, that we, we're always going to have demands, um, just sorry, we're always going to depend, we're always going to impact the natural world. And that forces us to recognise the limits that the natural world puts on our economies and indeed reshapes what we actually mean about sustainable growth and development. And here, and I won't touch on it for too long, the review actually formally produces uh, an economic model called the Bounded Global Economy Model, which really highlights what we mean um, in terms of a formal economic sense. So I'm not going to go into too much detail, but I just want to highlight a couple of things about this model. Um, the first is that natural capital enters it twice, both, and it, I'm going to be uh, referring back to the earlier part of my presentation, about making a real distinction here between provisioning services and regulating and maintenance ecosystem services. And indeed, the review highlights that a lot of these regulating and maintenance services, so whether it be for our climate, our soils, um, uh, water cycle, um, et cetera, um, a lot of them are complementary to each other. So that means that if we disturb one of them, it's more likely of what the um, ecology and earth sciences tell us is that we're going to disturb something else. And so when we're thinking about how our economic activities actually work in practice, they all have elements of both. They all have elements of actually extracting goods and services from the natural world, but also relying on these regulating and uh, maintenance services. And indeed, the, um, the review formalizes this in a model um, as, a, as shown here. So if we accept that we need to build those effective institutions and why we failed, and if we accept that there's, um, we need to accept that we're embedded in the natural world, we're embedded in the biosphere, as it were, to engage sustainable with nature, ultimately we need to change how we think, act, and measure economic success. And the review proposes three broad transitions that we need to go down. The first is we need to balance that impact equation. So we need to move from demand overshoot to back to that parity that our demands equal um, what nature can supply us. And indeed, because we've depleted uh, nature supply for so long, it's also critical we boost that supply. So we need to boost our natural assets. We need to build back um, our stock of natural assets. The second is we need to change our measures of economic success. The review highlights that while GDP is an indispensable tool to measure short run macroeconomic policy and um, the economic outlook, it does have pitfalls which, which aren't, which the review highlights, the, the academic debate has highlighted for a long time, that GDP is a flow measure, it's not a stock measure, and so it doesn't tell us about our stock of natural assets or our stock of producing human assets, uh, human capital assets. 
It also um, is gross domestic products. That is, it doesn't take into account the depreciation of our assets. Um, that would be net. And so what we need to do is ultimately we need to have our main measure of economic success being what the review calls inclusive uh, wealth. That is, what is the summation of our produced human and natural capital? And it's ultimately when going back to that management asset management framework is thinking about both the combination, but also the extent to which we're depleting or building our stock of assets or our portfolio of assets that ultimately will help us determine whether we're um, achieve, whether we can um, increase um, our collective prosperity. Um, I think we should always remember that when Adam Smith was um, writing about the wealth of nations, he did mean the wealth of nations and not the GDP of nations. And so this is really going back to some kind of core thinking about what it is in terms we actually value in terms of our, our society and what we want our economies to achieve. Third and finally, in, or, in order to balance that impact equation, to increase nature supply, to change our measures of economic success, we need to have transformative change in our institutions and systems to both enable that change, but also to have it sustained. And the review in particular highlights the role that our financial system, our global financial system and our education system can play in helping um, enable and sustain that change. So underpinning these transitions, um, there's various um, kind of recommendations in terms of policy options that the review highlights. And so I'm going to briefly just touch on them um, using this figure as a basis. So first, going to that first transition about it balancing the impact equation, I'm starting from uh, the 11 o'clock position and I'm going clockwise. Um, we It talks about the need to conserve and restore our natural assets. So that's really about both um, investing more in terms of conservation and restoration practices across the world to really make sure we build that stock of natural assets. The second is improving the efficiency of our extraction and produce less waste. We, we produce a vast amount of waste, particularly in the um, developed world in terms of food waste, for example. And so this is a really, so this point is about, we really need to reduce the amount of waste we're producing because it ultimately also will impact the ecosystems and therefore the economy. The third is fair and sustainable consumption, production and supply chain. So really at its core, this is about we need to make sure that our activities are truly sustainable. Again, going back to this demand and supply relationship and also fair that we need to have an equitable consumption, productive um, and supply chains. Um, equ equitability needs to be built into these, given the disparities between the developed and developing world. Third, better management of land and sea to benefit both nature and people. And so this is really at its core about thinking about ways that we can use land and sea for both people and planet. So a most obvious example at the moment is nature-based solutions that can, when done right, can help both biodiversity, but can also help us as a, as a species deal with climate change. And also in order to speed up the demographic transition, um, the review talks about the increased need to improve access to community-based family planning and reproductive health to both um, empower women worldwide and give them greater freedom in terms of what they choose in terms of family size. Second, and I won't touch on this one for too long because I've already described um, the concept of inclusive wealth. The review basically highlights that we need to move to it and beyond GDP and that by um, um, accounting for, for nature, indeed I showed in the economic model earlier, that that will actually um, change what we think or what we know about productivity because most productivity measures at the moment, if they only take into account human and produced capital, thereby implicitly have um, nature or, or our use of the natural world in total factor productivity and indeed what can be misconstrued as increased productivity gains often are increased depletion of our natural resources. Um, but the review, what the review highlights is that ultimately this all stems from whether it be inclusive wealth and be really um, embedding nature into product, productivity measures it is the need for natural capital accounting. So that's the real, that's the need to really account for nature and economic and financial decision making. And indeed, it was only a month ago that the UN, um, the UN um, statistics agency, um, there was agreement on um, a new measure of uh, ecosystem. Um, accounts that has come out and so what, what we expect to see in the next few years what we would hope is that governments across the world start to do this accounting for nature. Third and finally I already touched on a bit that um, the review highlights that the global financial system um, we need one that supports nature and that most of our um, the financial investments currently 
are tilted to one direction that is encouraging unsustainable um, practices or practices that degrade and or deplete our natural resources and that we need to um, rebalance the scales of global finance in a way that supports the natural world and the review highlights in particular um, the mechanisms of accounting for nature related financial risks so building on climate financial climate related financial risks so thinking about the, the risks that broader ecosystem degradation and depletion can bring um, to our businesses um, and to um, financial institutions but it also talks about the role in which um, a combination of um, by getting the right um, market structures incentives and regulation um, that we can encourage private finance to move or shift in a direction that supports the natural world alongside increased public finance um, and public funding of supporting our, our natural assets. Um, in terms of education, the, re the review highlights, and I'm sure as many of close to close to your heart at UCL, um, in, in order to, to really appreciate something um, or understand something such as the natural world, we ultimately need to learn about it. And so really, even from a young age, we need to think about how we improve curriculum, whether it be the economics curriculum, which I know the UCL in terms of its um, core curriculum, which is led, is going in the right direction, but also more broadly from a younger age in primary or secondary education, is to really think about really uh, um, allowing us at a young age to understand the natural world. Um, and then just very lastly, I told about I talked about effective institutions and whether that be at the very local level, whether that be at the very global level. And there's COP26, obviously hosted in Glasgow later this year. There's COP15, the Biodiversity COP, um, lesser often lesser talked about, which will be held in Quinming in China a month before in October. And so these are opportunities to really build some of these effective institutions. Um, but the review highlights that we really need to have this institution, um, effective institution building across the board. But very finally, while we need to build these institutions, we cannot, we can never forget that ultimately the institutions, the rules and regulations that govern our societies are ultimately determined by us as individuals. So we um, here in the UK living in a democracy, it is only through our democratic right um, and our abilities for freedoms, whether that be the choice of what we eat, whether it be the choice of what we consume more broadly, whether that be where we're putting our savings in financial institutions that are accounting for the depletion of the natural world and climate, um, climate change more broadly, it's through our choices and our decisions and our um, political demands that ultimately will be something that will ultimately be what we need to have to ultimately change are engaging with the natural world because in the end we all need to be our own judge and jury um, as um, in terms of protecting um, nature and ultimately having an economy that sustainably engages with the natural world. Um, and so I'll leave you with my summary bullets um, which just kind of um, give a broad perspective of, of the presentation I've just given and I'm happy to take any questions um, and thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Uh, extremely interesting. And I'm sure it has been uh, fascinating uh, uh, working and co-authoring this uh, important uh, uh, global review. Um, I, would, um, I would now uh, pass the ball to Professor Rikins uh, for, for the comments from uh, ISR perspective, of course. And uh, I, in the meantime, thank you very much, Thomas, for this uh, fantastic presentation. Yes, indeed. My thanks to Thomas, a great presentation, a really interesting, really important review. Um, and, and I want to start with that because I'm not going to be critical of the review, but I am going to be critical of the fact that these kinds of reviews don't seem to lead to any action. And the first thing, therefore, I will say is that uh, uh, practically everything you said was being said uh, 30 years ago. Um, I refer you to Blueprint for a Green Economy, published in 1989. Lead author was David Pierce, my predecessor at UCL here. And um, he said pretty well everything that. And it was a report that got great uh, traction in government at the time. Um, it was uh, picked up. Uh, he, was a he was a specialist advisor to the Department of the Environment at the time, and um, or the to the, the Secretary of State. And... To be honest, not much has happened, if we're to be frank, since then, uh, in order to address these issues. Um, it was recognized then that most ecosystem services are not 
recognized or valued in markets. Uh, it was recognized that they needed to be valued. They needed to be valued in cost benefit analysis at the micro level. They needed to be valued uh, through macro or adjusted GDP, what's now called inclusive wealth. Uh, but there are real problems with that. And you as an economist will know that. The valuations are very uncertain. They can give many different results. Um, so as a thought experiment, what kind of valuations would you have needed to put on ancient woodland for HS2 not to go ahead? HS2 was the result of a very extensive cost benefit valuation. We valued human time. We valued um, the, the journey time saved. We, we looked at the uh, opportunities for substituting from aviation. And yet uh, we know that it is proving environmentally very destructive in an island that has already destroyed most of its biodiversity. And um, I'm a great supporter of uh, fast trains and uh, high-speed rail for its environmental benefits. But nevertheless, that's a big question. What value would you have had to put on those habitats for HS2 to have been rendered uneconomic in total terms? And, and the second thing really is that um, uh, inclusive wealth has been published. I mean, there's a question in the, uh, in, in the chat. Inclusive wealth has been published by UNEP and the World Bank ever since 2012. Um, I was uh, privileged to contribute to the first report of that publication. And I don't know a single government that takes it seriously, not one. I mean, the UK numbers are there for inclusive wealth. We can see what, what it is, but by and large, it says it's all right because we are investing enough in health and education for human capital to go up. And that completely masks the fact that natural capital goes down. And because it's a monetary valuation and you add and subtract these things, they, uh, we, we, we don't get the message um, that you have given very clearly in this talk. And it's really interesting that in climate policy, we've moved right away from trying to um, value the damages. I've spent quite a lot of my academic life on things like the social cost of carbon and stuff. But actually, when it comes to policy, you've got to keep it simple. And we've settled on 1.5 or 2 degrees as the target and uh, getting to net zero by 2050 as the solution that is going to deliver that target. And, and I wonder what the biodiversity equivalent to that might be. I mean, we know that the world is not delivering very well on these targets so far. We've got to hope there's some, going to be some real um, real progress at COP uh, in, in that direction. But for biodiversity, we still have nothing uh, remotely in sight that, that is, is comparable to that. And um, I, I'm sort of really interested to, to push that along. And really just um, uh, one last thought before we get into questions on coming back to the Amazon, uh, which you know, for all of us, I mean, I've been, wor I've been worrying about the Amazon ever since the 1970s. Uh, and, and we've been seeing that it's been being destroyed since the 1970s. And actually, the problem is, is very simple in conceptual terms. It's that, uh, as you said, the Amazon is a fantastically productive system in terms of biodiversity. But that generates very little money. And when you chop it down and you put beef cattle on it, it's a very, very unproductive system in terms of biodiversity, but it generates a lot of money. And the current Brazilian president is much more interested in the generation of money than he is in biodiversity. And in that, he's not unlike any politician in any country that I can think of. So what one might do what might one do to change that situation? Well, we could obviously pay Brazil a lot of money not to chop down the Amazon. And uh, the Brazilian president has suggested that once or twice, but no one's really picked it up and taken it seriously. Uh, the question is who would pay? Would it be, would the UK pay from taxpayers? Would our taxpayers pay? Would we tax beef by 100% so that we generate twice as much money from beef sales and that money then goes over to Brazil to pay those. And I'm, I'm sure I don't need to ask you to speculate what you think the political reaction to um, taxing beef at, at a serious level that would uh, impress the Brazilian president would, would do. Or do we have to move towards a global government that actually says the Amazon is a terrestrial protected area? 
and make all the arrangements for enforcing that, given that there will be lots of people living locally who regard that as extremely unfair. So I think the Descriptor uh, Review lays down the problem. For me, the valuation part of it has not yet managed to be part of the solution uh, because those ideas have been around a long time. And it would just be nice to um, speculate a bit about that and to think about these kind of real world uh, ways in which we might respond to this problem, because as I'm sure you'll agree, um, we don't have another 30 years. We don't have another 30 years to sort this out. And we've known about this for 30 years and we've not done very much about it. So there we are, just a few provocative thoughts. Thank you very much, Paul. And uh, uh, as always, very inspiring and, and uh, thought pro provoking, of course. Um, uh, Thomas, would you like to uh, say something? Uh, we, we, yeah, we will then. Yeah, sure, sure, sure. I think, I think, Paul, you made some, uh, um, well, undeniably great points. Um, so I'm, I, I'll try, I'll try and keep my comments brief just because of the rest of the Q&A, but I'm sure I'll touch on a lot of the other stuff as well. I mean, I guess just on some of your kind of main points in terms of the valuation point, I think that, that, that is a key one. I think what, what the review says or wants to say though, and as I'm sure kind of as you and colleagues will be aware is, we can't let perfection get in the way um, of the good. And so I think, and I just kind of want to stick on say the Amazon, for example, but indeed let, let's put it out to any rainforest. Um, there's a point here about um, the, the, the true value of nature and valuing aspects of nature. And indeed by doing the latter, we can still get to a place which doesn't one contradict the former about mispricing or misvaluing it. And, in, and indeed, so if we think about a rainforest, there are ways, I think the IMF and others have introduced methods where you can actually look at the extent to which the ecosystem services that these, um, that these ecosystems, whether it be forests or whether they did, for example, they did a great study on whales um, and their carbon capture and their contribution to kind of other, other ecosystem services, even by those partial, and I underscore partial valuation measures, you will get in monetary terms, numbers that vastly outweigh any market price for, for others, say, in terms of a whale and its carbon capture, um, what we're paying in terms of um, carbon, other carbon solutions. And so that is one way to, to what the review would highlight is to estimate a lower bound on nature's value. And so by doing that, you're recognizing whether it be an economic financial policy decision maker, you know that your valuation is getting you partly, but not all the way there, but even through that part way exercise, you're getting a monetary value that vast outweighs some other investment or social or other investment products that projects that you might do. So there is that. So I think there are techniques, I agree with you wholeheartedly, that we haven't we're not doing it en masse, but there is stuff to get us there. And I think it's getting this balance between we're never going to get a perfect number indeed, nature nature is um we're never going to get its true value um uh it doesn't nature doesn't have a total price but it does have a value and we can try our best way to get there but it's never going to be what with a price of a single monetary number and then just before we get into the q a because i'm conscious of what <laughs> answer the q a in terms of um why now why what makes this review different i mean i think um uh, kind of, I guess, as, as you'll also be aware, that this was the first, this is the first review ever commissioned by a government in government. There's the first finance ministry ever to co commission a review on economics of biodiversity or on biodiversity more generally. And indeed, I think um, if we look back at 2006 when um, Sir Nick Stern did a review on climate change, I think it's fair to say, and um, I say this because um, uh, Sir Nick was part of the um, advisory panel, even in real time. Um, I don't think people really appreciated the magnitude of what the, the, the review was saying, um, his, his review on climate change. And indeed, if we look now, it's nearly 15 years later and the world is seriously, I think it's fair to say, acting. Um, so I think in part, part for us, I know there's the time dimension that we don't have time to lose, but I think it's one thing that we're at least seeing progress. And I think a big thing, I mean, obviously, um, you're going to know better in terms of where we were in terms of, um, 30, 40 years ago in terms of where the, the debate was. I think a key thing, and I say this because I think I'm, I'm old enough now to say referring to the young people, um, is that we, have no, we are now seeing a generation of young people, and I mean this is across the world, this isn't just in advanced economies, that really are proactively raising these concerns. 
um, that are proactively asking for answers, demanding solutions. And just to end on the point about net zero, um, what the review says about targets, even when it comes to nature, we had the Aichi targets that were supposed to happen over the last decade. Not one of the 20 was reached. But why weren't they reached? Well, we can set targets as long as we want. We can set targets every year for something new. The key thing about setting a target is enforcement. And it's about monitoring and, and making sure that if we miss a target, we punish we, we, if we miss a target. Who do we punish? We punish those in the decision-making world. Um, and it kind of goes back to what I said at the end is, really, we can have review after review, we can have target after target, but ultimately, it's going to be the individual, that's everyone here listening, that's everyone in the world, holding the decision-makers to account for the decisions whether they do or do not reach targets, that will mean we either sustainably engage with the natural world, we either reach net zero or we don't. So if we all have a part to play. We, we're, we're all in this together, truly, when it comes to nature and climate change. I need to amuse myself. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, of course, uh, uh, we, um, we uh, as Axley was saying, time is our tyrant, right? So <laughs> we, we will try... We will do our best to read uh, as, as many questions as we could. Uh, the first one is very straightforward. Can, can we share the slides? Yes, I would. Yeah, that's, that's fair. The slides, I think, I think Harry or you, Lorenzo, will share the slideshow to everyone afterwards, so that's fine. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much. And yeah, we will we will start from the very the very uh, top of, of the of the questions. Then very very first one from uh, Mina. Should we uh, uh, been saying uh, we are in a climate and ecological emergency, or a climate and biodiversity emergency, or either is fine. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's a, it's a great question. I mean, funnily enough, um, definitions, um, surprising or not, um, kind of were quite a big thing in the review. Um, I think I would say here, I, I don't, I think it's, I think Eva would, would kind of be fine. I'm sure that scientists would, would definitely press you on having a more precise thing. But I think, and I kind of guess it goes to the heart of this is, um, whether it be climate change or biodiversity loss, I mean, let's, let's be very clear here. They're, symptom, they're both symptoms of humanity's unsustainable engagement. So they're both, they're both what some people are calling two sides of the same coin. What, what we're doing that's contributing to climate change, ultimately these underlying forces have contributed to biodiversity loss. Um, so I think it's when we think, and then just to add to that, when we're thinking about solutions, indeed, I think the science, the science is unequivocal. We, we will not solve the issue of climate change over its two degrees, one and a half degrees, without also addressing the biodiversity crisis. And one fact which I, I, I seem to, well, sticks in my head for ages, um, was fact on um, um, land and sea change, which is even if tomorrow we stopped burning any new fossil fuels, if tomorrow that was it, we decided to stop, given the emissions from just our land systems as they currently exist and operate, we would not hit 1.5 degrees Celsius. These are the kind of things that we need to remember when we're talking about reaching net zero, that this isn't just a burning fossil fuels issue. This is also about land sea change. This is also about how we um, interact with it um, and invasive species. This is, this is broader. So I think it's about thinking about those ultimately as a tandem, yes. And perhaps Thanks. I could just, I'll come, come in for 10 seconds and just to say, I don't mind what kind of emergency you call it. It'd be good to treat it as an emergency. At the moment, we're not treating it as an emergency of any kind at all. We've seen what governments do when they tr when they see an emergency. COVID is an emergency, and we see what governments are prepared to do to address that. Uh, we haven't even started on either climate or biodiversity in treating it in those terms, and yet we know that that's what it's going to take. I, I would like to add uh, half an hour on this webinar to talk about time differences <laughs> and salience and time tangibility of, of, of issues uh, from and, and participate to the to the discussion now uh, th but thank you very much both for uh, for responding this one and uh, Paul if if I may can I ask you the second one from from Peter so uh, is it is about uh, um, the and and also Thomas because it's of course uh, related to the Dasgupta review it's about the um, debate between uh, uh, let's say Norgard and, and Carney so um, like accommodationists that want to integrate like old nature, art capital, etc., in uh, classical economics uh, uh, 
uh, rational and background. And, and of course, the co-evolutionists, right? So uh, was this uh, like this kind of uh, uh, thug of war, as, as Peter is, is, is defining it, uh, uh, evident during the discussions related to the Das Gupta review? And which of the two perspectives do you think uh, will likely to prevail? So maybe, uh, Paul, uh, the, the, the end of the question and, and Thomas, the first part of the question. Yeah. Sure, sure. I'll, I'll keep. I'll keep it very brief to, to give Paul, because um, I'm sure Paul will have a very a good amount to say, in it, um, and much more enlightening than I'm going to be. Um, the, the thing I'd just say here is, um, I mean, the review start. I mean, I, I don't want to get into different camps just because I just to focus on where the reviews approach was. Um, ultimately, but and I think I already touched. We already touched on a great discussion about how you value and what value is associated with price. So we've touched on that. Ultimately, unless, unless we bring nature into our decision making, unless we account for it, things won't change. We don't, we, if you think about anything, if you don't account for the impact of, on something you have or the dependency, you're not going to care about it or you're not going to consider it in your decision making. So kind of going to the point I made on the slide that about that our, our economy is embedded within the natural world. We need to recognize that and we need to use and think and act like that is the case because that is the reality. So unless we start doing that, we're going to be living, living in a world which is embedded in the natural world, but acting like we're external to it. And obviously that's incompatible. And that's what we've seen at a global level for decades. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, Coldplay from uh, UCL were uh, singing aliens. So we are... <laughs> Aliens in uh, in our own planet, uh, uh, Paul. Uh, who who do you think will uh, will be likely to prevail? Well, I mean, I'd like to start from where Thomas left us because it was absolutely right. I mean, the the reality, the physical reality we live in is that we are embedded in and part of uh, the natural system, and that's that. And if we screw it up, we know what happens. We we will disappear as a species, and the planet will go on and evolve other species. So I'm, I'm very much an evolutionary economist in that sense, because I think that is the reality we live in. The question then is, what kind of economic system uh, can best reflect that? And undoubtedly, Thomas is right, is that if we could get these prices, if we could double the cost of beef, then sure, we, we could do all sorts of things with the, within the neoclassical framework. If we could get a carbon price, a global carbon price of, of $100 a ton around the world, um, uh, it, there would be absolute enormous change because markets would take account of that and markets would really react to, to, to that. The problem is that we haven't been able to do that. And the question is whether we will be able to do it or whether actually we would be better taking another approach, such as perhaps the targets approach that we're now taking with, with, uh, with, with carbon and climate um, and, and addressing those things directly rather than uh, through the issue of valuation. Um, from a personal point of view, I don't care which works. Um, you know, I, I just think we've, we've, got to, we've, we've got to find a, a process that works and undoubtedly getting the prices going and taking notice of them would work. We, we know that would be the case, but po politically politicians find that extraordinarily difficult and that's rooted really in human behavior because when over generations we've been getting things for free and we haven't been paying for them, when you suddenly suggest that people start paying for them, well, everything that you know about behavioral economics, Lorenzo, because you're an expert in that, tells you that politically that's really difficult. People don't like suddenly having to pay for stuff that they've already, that they regard as their right, which they've always had for free. And so that is a really big political problem, but it's, it's absolutely at the heart, whether we do it through people paying for it or whether we tell them they can't do stuff as we've been prepared to do over the lockdown, you know, you just can't do certain things because there's an emergency going on. We haven't even begun to take those sorts of approaches yet with regard to this emergency. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, I will move to the next question uh, from uh, uh, David. So business models uh, are designed to be successful in the economic ecosystem in which they operate. Largely, the environment, uh, uh, climate change, biodiversity, and habitat loss are treated as externalities, only addressed by policies and regulations. So very uh, in line with what we were saying. Uh, 
to, to what extent uh, is the economic ecosystem in the modern world incompatible uh, yeah. with the need uh, uh, to act responsibly and address those externalities? So, yeah, pretty yeah. much in line with what we discussed already. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, I was going to say, not, not to demean the question or to just go over it, but I thought Paul gave an excellent answer. I think it's markets work, markets work on behalf of us as a society. And so if we as decide to put a policy, whether it be a carbon tax or other taxes on agricultural commodities, they would react and they would, would do it. So it's, it's not that there's anything inherently wrong with a market system. It's you need to, the rules and regulation of the game have to be such. So I think Paul touched on it perfectly. Thanks. I, I, I will. Uh, I will continue now. And uh, um, Paul Thomas, we have a, a question from uh, uh, from ISR itself, uh, no, uh, Energy Institute, I think, uh, from uh, Jen. So fantastic presentation. Thanks. What do you think might be the key <laughs> barriers to the uptake of these recommendations? For example, uh, why will some argue against the switch from GDP to inclusive wealth? Sure. It's a, yeah, it's a really good question. And I'm sure I know also good time for Paul, um, because Paul has had also great experience in this field for some time, so he'll be able to be talking about it. I mean, um, just to say a few things on, on the take up and everything, and then this is kind of the more boring process and stuff. The government has committed to do a response, to a formal response to the review, which will come later this year. Naturally, with the, the government also doing COP26 and the, the G7 presidency it holds, um, nature has already been stated as playing an important role, but that, that's a one side and the kind of bigger question about systemic global uptake. Um, I think Paul touched on a key one um, is the behavioral aspect, as in uh, shift, shifting of mindset is hard. Shifting of mindset isn't something, again, for those, for those of us who have done behavioral economics to some extent, is, isn't um, a, a simple endeavor. And so I think that's that's a key barrier. I think a second key barrier is um, even how we think about the world. So you'd have noticed in my presentation I, we, I, today we talked about develop, developing world, rich and poorer nations. When it comes to natural capital, actually a lot of those more developing emerging economies, um, which might be low income in a pure income sense, a high proportion of their wealth from what we know in that inclusive wealth framework, they're actually natural capital and nature rich. And so thinking about these countries or these economies in that perspective then give, changes the mindset as in what we've seen for advanced economies um, and high income countries is that we're, we're rich in the sense that we've um, accumulated producing, producing human capital, which have, have a higher monetary value than we've prescribed to natural capital. And so part about, but that's what we've done. We've depleted a lot of our natural capital ourselves. But now when we're seeing about these developing countries, recognizing that they're richer um, in terms of these actual assets, in terms of natural assets, will also, again, it's this mindset to, terminology shift. And so in terms of that pickup point about GDP versus inclusive wealth, for example, part, partly there's the data and, and there's the methodological, there's the integration issues, but we'll leave that to one side because I'm sure none of us want to hear about that at our lunchtime. Um, but there is this point about you needing, if one country does inclusive wealth, it's good and it's promising. And indeed, you're seeing some such as New Zealand, while not completely compatible with that, have definitely gone more down an inclusive wealth budgetary framework. It's the needing to have that um, local effort, national effort, but it needs to be married with a kind of global agreement or global standard about shifting towards that because um, that, that, that point about, I touched on before about nature's different in different aspects of, of the world, other bits of the world are more biodiverse than others. So it's, it's always going to be different in different aspects about when we're kind of valuing and accounting for nature. Yeah, very quickly on, on that, Jen, um, I've never heard anyone arguing against uh, the switch from GDP to inclusive wealth. Uh, the intellectual argument is absolutely clear and it's very well set out by Thomas and by the, um, by the Descupta review. We just don't do it. And the reason we don't do it is because actually, whatever we may say about GDP, we love it. Uh, it's much more than a macroeconomic indicator of the kind that Thomas was saying. Because when GDP goes up, households get richer, because that's what it means. Our incomes go up. Businesses become more profitable because there's more money flowing around, so they make more profits. And politicians get higher taxes because as the economy grows, 
the tax the tax take increases. Natural wealth, um, uh, I'm sorry, inclusive wealth doesn't do any of those things for these aspects of people's and businesses and politicians' daily lives. And for as long as that is the case, we're going to find that whatever we may say about the intellectual arguments of inclusive wealth, we continue actually to focus on GDP because that's what delivers the bacon that um, uh, most of us find that we are interested in most of the time. Yeah, and, and from, from a behavioral perspective, I would say that uh, the, talking about uh, GDP, one way to try to counter, counterbalance that would be increasing the salience of um, the a, a possibly estimated uh, average remuneration of the natural capital, right? So which, which figures are we putting in front? To, like which, which single di like digit figure we we bring in front of the GDP. That's that's the main challenge, not only from for from a like a biodiversity perspective, of course, but all the things that are making a, a growth inclusive. Uh, it's it's very difficult to make something salient and and clear as as a, as GDP that has so many um, flows. Um, mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, I will I will move uh, to the next question in the meantime, uh, Thomas. Uh, how can you reflect these metrics in carbon pricing policy to help the UK uh, meet its um, now even more ambition, ambitious carbon target, uh, carbon budget target for next zero in a sustainable way? Um, that, that's a great, that's a really great question. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of going to kind of wriggle out of it purely just because the review didn't really, the review didn't touch on net zero. I mean, there's a whole other net zero strand. This was purely on, on the biodiversity point. I mean, I think there's the point about metrics, if I can kind of push the question more towards um, biodiversity. Um, what part of the reason, part of the beauty of biodiversity is it's a complex issue. Um, but I don't think we need to be overawed by its complexity. There's some great, I mean, it's never going to be perfect. There are quite a few good metrics out there, whether it be mean species abundance, the living planet index, there's others. So we, we've, got, we've got a sense of the issue. Um, and we know that there's different aspects of nature, um, whether it be organisms, more ecosystem, bigger ecosystems than that. So we, we already have that sense. And I think it's about actually, a bit like Paul said, more about kind of getting to the more deep point about talk and action. It's we have got a sufficient understanding. We've got the data. We've got the metrics to know what's happening. We've just got to get on and do the policies that will do it. We'll, we, we know from history, we'll get better data, we'll get better metrics over time, but we don't have time to wait around waiting for the perfect metric because by the time that's happened, we might not have an um, inhabitable planet um, to, to be able to use that metric effectively. Paul, uh, do you have a uh, comment on that? Um, oh, I think that's great. That's a very, that's a very, good, note to, a very good note to finish on and I entirely agree with what Thomas just said. <laughs> Fantastic. So I'm aware of times. Uh, Thomas, would you be happy to come again uh, when the final review will be? Uh, <laughs> so, so, yeah, so, that, so that actually that, the final review did come out in February. So that was all the final review. So the government response will come later. Um, but but the, yeah, the final, the final review is out and I can send the link um, for people to read it. There's various versions. Um, I'm sure everyone, if you're doing um, studying for exams or whatever, you I would probably tell you not to read the 600 page version because you're going to um, spend a lot of time on that. But there are shorter versions um, and there, and one of the short versions is only 10 pages. And actually, we published it in different languages um, because um, ultimately sustainably engaging with nature is a global endeavor. And so we need to make sure it's accessible to all. But I'm, I'm more than happy also to come back for a general yeah, discussion. Yeah. If we I guess, uh, um, there will be all the recommendations, uh, recommendations later on after COP15, yeah. right? And all all that so that that would be a, like uh, probably the the follow up let's say to the yeah yeah before, right yeah. so uh, that uh, we will be happy to uh, host you again uh, uh, in our uh, uh, webinars of course uh, thank you everyone um, and thanks to uh, our of course uh, whoever participate uh, the, here with uh, to our to our webinar and thank you thomas and paul for uh, uh, being our panelists and for uh, the a uh, great presentation on the, on the Das Gupta review. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Lorenzo. Thank you, Paul. And thank you to everyone else at ISR. Thanks.
Thank you. Bye. See you.